Good morning. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to warmly welcome all of you to this side event on youth engagement and vocational training, innovative approaches to address discrimination, inequality, and violence. My name is Sevel Alerzaeva, and I am Chief of the Office of Undersecretary General Vladimir Varankov in the United Nations in New York. Mr. Varankov is the head of the United Nations Office of Counterterrorism. On behalf of Under Secretary General Varankov, I would like to express our sincere gratitude to the government of Azerbaijan for its hospitality. I am delighted that we are joined this morning by Mr. Farid Jafarov. Thank you, Mr. Jafarov, for being here, Executive Director of the Azerbaijan Youth Foundation. We appreciate the unique opportunity to hold this side event during the fifth World Forum for Intercultural Dialogue here in Baku at the crossroads of cultures and civilizations, history and modernity. The Baku process is a remarkable contribution from the government of Azerbaijan to bringing humanity together in the pursuit of peace, development and human rights drawing strength from diversity, mutual understanding, and respect. I would also like to thank our co-organizers from UNESCO and the United Nations Alliance of Civilizations. We are proud to be convening this side event with them. They are essential partners for the United Nations Office of Counterterrorism and for member states in effectively preventing terrorism and the underlying spread of violent extremism. We would also like to thank our donors who support the United Nations Office of Counterterrorism and this event, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, and 30 donors who support the office. Ladies and gentlemen, we are witnessing an alarming rise in hate speech, xenophobia, and other forms of bigotry, which can incite terrorist violence beyond the enduring yet evolving threat posed by ISIL and Al Qaeda. Intolerance today spreads at light speed across the internet and social media, compounded by misinformation and disinformation, connecting like-minded individuals and reaching vul vulnerable audiences. The recent heinous terrorist attacks against mosques in New Zealand and against churches and hotels on Easter Sunday in Sri Lanka were a painful reminder that the threat of terrorism is potent multifaceted and indiscriminate. I would like to pay tribute to all the victims and survivors of terrorism around the world. The international community must stay united and cannot relent in its efforts to prevent and counter terrorism in all its forms and manifestations. Member states have recognized and reiterated that traditional security responses are not enough. There is no silver bullet. We need more buttons to push to tackle terrorism in all its complexity. We need a comprehensive and inclusive approach to address the drivers and conditions conducive to terrorism in different contexts, bringing all levels and sectors of government and society together. Effective counterterrorism is linked with broader efforts to sustain peace achieve sustainable development and realize universal human rights with prevention as the golden thread. I am particularly happy, therefore, that we have this opportunity to engage with you today. You all have a stake and role to play in your different capacities to build resilience to violent extremism. The extremely rich presentations and discussions that took place over the last two days are testament to this. We also attended the morning presentations and interactive discussion, which was very interesting and uh, provided necessary inputs for us to continue to work and develop our youth program. Ladies and gentlemen, counterterrorism is a top priority for Secretary General Antonio Guterres. His first reform initiative with the support of the General Assembly was to establish 
our office, the United Nations Office of Counterterrorism, in June 2017 to step up coordinated support member states in their efforts to implement the global counterterrorism strategy and relevant Security Council resolutions. UNOCT is mandated to provide policy leadership, enhance coordination and coherence, strengthen the provision of capacity building upon request, mainstream counterterrorism in the work of the United Nations and raise visibility and mobilize resources for UN counterterrorism efforts. We work through the United Nations Global Counterterrorism Coordination Compact, the largest coordination framework at the United Nations, bringing together 36 UN entities, including UNESCO and the United Nations Alliance of Civilizations, as well as Interpol and the World Customs Organization. We provide capacity building support to member states thanks to generous contributions from over 30 donors to the United Nations Counterterrorism Trust Fund, including the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, the United States, the European Union, the State of Qatar, the Netherlands, Russian Federation, and other donors. The United Nations Counterterrorism Center, located within UNOCT, is currently implementing 40 global, regional, and national projects under the four pillars of the global counterterrorism strategy. Ladies and gentlemen, today, nearly half of the world's population is 24 years old or younger. The Secretary General has directed UNOCT and the whole United Nations system to put an absolute priority on engaging and empowering youth in the context of counterterrorism, especially preventing and countering violent extremism. We submitted last February to donors our first consolidated multi-year appeal for support to UN counterterrorism efforts. The appeal is on your tables in front of you and it includes 23 projects with a focus on youth involving 13 different UN entities. Young people are affected by terrorism in multiple ways, and we heard about it during the presentation earlier today. They are the deliberate aim and collateral victims of attacks. They are targeted by terrorist propaganda and preyed upon by recruiters. They suffer the direct and indirect political social and economic costs and consequences of terrorism on their communities and societies. Terrorism robs young people of their lives and opportunities, of their present and their future. Youth, therefore, have as much, if not more, at stake than anyone else in counterterrorism, and we need to engage them more effectively and sincerely. Not just as helpless victims, not just as a risk population who can indeed be susceptible to terrorist narratives and radicalization because of alienation and frustration. We need to engage youth as partners in building resilience, as positive change makers, because young women and girls, young men and boys are central to creating a safer, more inclusive and prosperous world. We need their involvement and their energy in the search for peace, development, justice, and respect for human rights. If we want to counter the manipulative messages of terrorists to lure young people, we have to engage and listen to them on their terms. We need very practical and innovative ways to empower them, not to contain them, to help them raise and address their concerns. Ladies and gentlemen, the Secretary General has called on member states to take a strategic investment in young people and is committed to make the organization more relevant and responsive to them. Our discussion today is part of earnest efforts to seek feedback and inputs from a wider community, especially youth themselves and practitioners working with youth, from you in this room, in order to guide the development of a new global youth program, which I will address in more details after the opening remarks. I look forward to hearing your ideas, your views, your interest in partnering with us. 
whether you are representing member states today, civil society, academia, or private sector and businesses. Thank you for your attention. It is my pleasure now to give the floor to Mr. Farid Jafarov, Executive Director of the Azerbaijan Youth Foundation. Thank you, Seville, and good morning to everyone, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends. I'm kind of confused in which language should I continue. I, so can I ask the audience if everyone understands English? So should I continue in English? Can you raise your hand? Yes, yeah, so great. It's really uh, nice to see that we have so many educated young people in Azerbaijan. So um, young people, as Seville said, are vulnerable, is, a, is the most vulnerable category of the society. They are not only prone to side effects and external effects, but they are also the category that is driving the society forward and that is making the changes. Of course, today we see that in the world, xenophobia, inequality and discrimination is widely spreading. And during these two days, we spoke a lot about the raising xenophobia and discrimination in, in some parts of the world. But um, we can proudly say that in Azerbaijan, the young people especially, is very resilient to extremism and violence. And actually, we have a few factors that determined this resilience. First of all, we as a country in our history, in our recent modern history, lived up the terrorism. We saw the terrorism, we saw the extremism, especially just after regaining our independence, um, when the neighboring country, Armenia, unleashed a war and um, then they um, organized a lot of uh, a number of a series of terrorist acts in our cities and regions. And the second factor, I would say, the, the most important is that in our culture and traditions, um, we have the core value of tolerance. And as the, Mr. President Ilham Aliyev mentioned yesterday, Azerbaijan has been a land of tolerance, um, religious and ethnic tolerance for centuries. And we should keep this value very high, and uh, we should evaluate this as high as possible because, um, as I mentioned in the, in the previously, um, terrible things are happening in, in some part of the world and that's because of the ri raising uh, xenophobia and discrimination against some people on ethnic and religious uh, basis. And the third, third factor, um, one of the major factors that our young people, you are so resilient to extremism and violent um, terrorism is that the priority of the youth policy in Azerbaijan is aimed on empowering young people. And when I say empowering, I mean in all spheres, starting from education, ending with employment, and so on. And um, today we had an interesting session this morning, and there were some different young people coming from different parts of the world and uh, telling their stories of uh, fighting extremism in their parts. And in, in the opening um, remarks, Ms. Leila Aliyeva mentioned the um, importance of education. And she said that education does not just mean gaining knowledge and skills for professional development, but moral and spiritual education is equally important. And that's what we do in Azerbaijan um, through the different agencies, through the Youth Foundation, and also this through the projects of the Minister of Youth and Sports, um, and within the youth houses that are spread um, in the country, we have around 40 youth houses uh, that operate not only in the capital, Baku, and also in the regions. Um, so uh, the Youth Foundation, just a few words about the the agency that I'm representing, the Youth Foundation was set up in 2011 by the President um, to support the young people in their efforts to um, gain knowledge and skills. And through these years, the Youth Foundation as finance has funded more than 4,000 projects from 
individual young people and the youth organizations. And uh, we are now continuing our work on this and we have enlarged the competencies of the Youth Foundation and um, according to the decree of the President, the Youth Foundation now has the power to support the young people in the education um, aspirations also in the foreign countries. So we will be launching, starting from this month, the Education Abroad Program. Um, the, also on employment front, the Youth Foundation, um, that's also one of the innovative approaches of the Azerbaijan, is um, to give the wage subsidies for the young people who, who doesn't have the work experience because we all know that when we apply for a job and the first argument or the first question that we receive is about our past work experience. And in most cases, the students that have just graduated from the university who obviously doesn't have the work experience um, cannot get the job that they need. Um, so to solve this problem, the, one of the innovative approaches can be seen the um, employment program of the Youth Foundation where we will be subsidizing the wage, the some part of the wage of such kind of um, young people. Um, just in general, I, I really look forward to hear more about um, innovative approaches from our experts that um, kindly uh, here to uh, enlighten us on this issue. And um, for the last thing, I have to say that Every stakeholder, including the state agencies and the individual young people, the NGOs, and also the international organizations, of course, has a role to play in fighting the um, extremism and terrorism. And um, for, for the responsibility concerning the, um, the state agencies, um, our major responsibility is to create the conducive um, conditions for the young people to realize their potential, to realize their dreams and desires. So with these words, I would like to finish my speech, uh, the opening remarks, and pass the floor again to Seville. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Jafarov, for sharing Azerbaijan experience in engaging with and supporting youth. Uh, and thank you also for telling us about uh, the work uh, which is handled by the Youth Foundation. As you rightly said, uh, the youth is not only prone to side and external effects, but our youth also drives world forward. I would like to ask my colleague from the United Nations, Ms. Nihal Saad, who is the Chief of Cabinet and Spokesperson for the High Representative United Nations Alliance of Civilization. Nihal, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Seville. Uh, and um, I'm very um, uh, honored to be uh, among uh, the speakers in this distinguished uh, panel uh, with these distinguished panelists. And um, um, indeed, this um, uh, theme that you are discussing uh, is very timely and very important. And I don't want to be repeating uh, what um, um, Seville and uh, Mr. Uh, Jafarov uh, uh, have uh, just mentioned, and I don't want also to be repeating uh, what you have already heard uh, from the uh, High Representative for the United Nations Alliance of Civilizations in the previous session, uh, in the plenary session, uh, that uh, we organized uh, uh, today. Um, uh, I think most of you have um, attended it. So um, I just wanted to focus uh, on uh, certain areas that were not mentioned perhaps uh, in um, the plenary session because it is very much related when we talk about um, 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 youth for peace and when we talk about the, this theme uh, which is youth engagement and vocational training and what are these innovative approaches to address discrimination, inequality and violence, we see that uh, youth again are center and front in all these efforts. And the youth um, are, have been identified as one of the four pillars or the four main focus areas in the work of the United Nations Alliance of Civilizations as 
um, identified by the uh, high-level group report since the inception of the United Nations in uh, Alliance of Civilizations in the year 2006. Um, youth, we work with youth, and we work for youth, and we thought from the very beginning, since 2006, that uh, young people are essential partners in fulfilling and implementing the mission of the Alliance of Civilizations. And what is this mission? The mission is to uh, br bring, uh, build bridges of understanding uh, among diverse cultures, ethnicities, religions, through uh, strengthening and promoting intercultural and interfaith dialogue. Uh, this is a very important tool in order uh, to uh, prevent uh, conflicts and also for conflict resolution. And um, in, um, we have seen examples, I mean, um, uh, earlier in the day, uh, of those young people and, uh, who are leading uh, grassroots organizations, working with the community at the community level in a bottom-up approach in order to prevent violent extremism, which is um, on, a, on, a, um, on the rise every single day, which is actually sad because when we look at what the global community have been doing, what we as the United Nations Alliance of Civilizations have been doing uh, for the past 15 years is exactly the opposite of what's happening um, now uh, in the world. And um, it is sad because we see that um, sometimes we feel that our efforts are in vain, but again, the stories, the success stories, and the accomplishments of young people that we have sponsored through uh, seed funding or mentorship uh, programs or exchange programs, when we hear the bright stories and their achievements and accomplishments, although at a small scale, we feel optimistic that by um, uh, more engagement with the youth by expanding that space that we give them, that we gave them, by giving them more empowerment, we are on the right track. Um, perhaps uh, Seville, at the very beginning, also she mentioned um, uh, the, um, the United Nations Global <coughs> Counterterrorism. Um, coordination Compact Task Force, it's a, it's, it's, it's a long uh, uh, title, but uh, these are 36 entities, 36 UN entities who are working together in the aspect of prevention and countering violent extremism. And we were really, um, I think that this is one of the major achievements um, and one of the major um, um, important steps that has been taken in the direction of countering uh, global terrorism and uh, in prevention efforts. Um, uh, establishing the uh, UN Office of Counterterrorism sort of brought all those UN entities who are working towards the same end and towards the same objectives together in, and, and, and trying to um, coordinate their work and, uh, and let them work in partnerships together, finding synergies in their work so that when we work collectively, really, it is, that, it is then that we achieve the best results. Because each and every one of us, at least our organization, is a very small organization with uh, limited resources in terms of uh, human resources and financial resources, but we saw also the benefits of partnering with other organizations who are sort of doing the same uh, work or they have the same objectives that we have. So working in silos um, um, is no longer an option. I think that working together in partnerships, this is what will make the impact of our, of our work um, 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 stronger. And we will see also, uh, and not only stronger, but also a wider uh, impact. We will see a wider impact of our work if we work collectively. Um, uh, just very quickly also, um, uh, that uh, we, um, uh, we, we, we have one of the priority areas as well in our work is education. But uh, youth and education, we see that uh, youth pillar is cross-cutting with all the other pillars in the work of the Alliance, which are education, youth, media, and migration. Particularly in the area of um, media and education, we see that a lot of our youth activities is cross-cutting with those two other pillars. Uh, we consider that education is, uh, uh, is very important, uh, particularly uh, if we're talking about prevention strategies to build the resilience of young people. 
And um, one of those examples, perhaps, that was not represented in the 14 alumni that we um, that you saw or heard uh, earlier this morning was a program called Young Peace Builders, and it takes youth leaders through both an online and in-person curricula to enhance their peace building skills. Um, there is also an applied learning um, stage uh, in, the, in, the, in, in this program where the participants are expected to put what they learned into practice and begin peace initiatives in their own communities. We have um, had two editions of that uh, program, one in Jordan and one in West Africa. We are planning another one. Uh, soon uh, this year as well. I think it's in the MENA region. Um, yes, uh, it is in the MENA region as well. But we are going to be introducing in the next um, iteration of the Young Peace Builders perhaps the PVE component um, in the modules that we are giving to uh, the modules that we are um, uh, providing to those uh, young peace builders, we will also include um, um, perhaps um, uh, um, um, an element about how we develop their um, uh, critical thinking skills. And when I talk about critical thinking skills, it's very important as well because when you start building and um, uh, building that skill and and uh, nurturing that skill from a young age. Uh, I think this is a, the long-term strategy that we should all be talking about because when you have this ability to distinguish between what is, let's say, an inc incitement, what is fake news, what is hate speech, uh, the effort that the global community is now doing in order to counter hate speech in the media is not going to be that difficult because from the source, um, the end user have this skill to distinguish uh, between what is really uh, a hate speech and what is uh, racist rhetoric, what is um, fake news. So you build the skill, and this is a long-term strategy um, as opposed to the short-term and the medium-term strategies of um, uh, uh, curbing hate speech in the media and uh, taking it offline and putting it online and getting into this whole controversy about um, freedom of expression and uh, controlling hate speech in the media, which is, I think, the big issue that everyone is grappling with, whether we're talking about governments or even us as, in, as international community or as UN entities. Um, I'm about to wrap this because I I would like to hear uh, other colleagues and also to open the floor for um, for discussions. Um, um, we, we we also um, uh, use new technologies uh, such as uh, video uh, video apps uh, in order to build the skill the build the skills of young people uh, on uh, peace on peace building and on nurturing a culture of peace at a young age. So um, we um, uh, think that also that. Uh, uh, um, uh, one more uh, issue what, uh, is that uh, we had uh, organized in New York uh, last November uh, our eighth uh, global forum, and we invited 100 of our alumni uh, and youth, uh, young people in, in that forum, and um, the summary, uh, and they had a, a set of recommendations, uh, that the most important of which was uh, an increased focus on socioeconomic opportunities, including self-employment and entrepreneurship to mitigate the marginalization of youth. And uh, this was also recognized in um, the uh, high-level group report which called for countering socioeconomic alienation due to the rise of uh, youth unemployment. Uh, I would like to uh, leave it there and um, I'm willing to take any questions if you have any. Thank you so much. I would like to thank Nihal for her presentation and uh, I just would like to uh, mention that uh, the uh, mission of the United Nations uh, Alliance of Civilization as outlined by Nihal is to bridge cultures, religious civilizations and to be at forefront of conflict resolution. Uh, and thank you Nihal also for telling us about the longer term strategy on curbing hate speech. Very much appreciated. I would like now to give the floor to Ms. Nada Al-Nashif, our UNESCO Assistant uh, Director General for Social and Human, Human Sciences. Uh, you have the floor. Thank 
Thank you. Thanks very much. Apologies, I was late. I'm sure I missed something, and I hope we will continue uh, the conversation. Um, let me say that my sector at UNESCO coordinates our work uh, with young people, and I'm, I'm going to try and do three things. One, tell you how we are rethinking how we work with young people at UNESCO. Um, second, talk a little bit about what areas of work um, would be most interesting, I think, for us to explore with young people and, and how we are engaging. And three, give you a concrete example with the, uh, I think, with the um, uh, with OCT, uh, where we are working together on a joint project, which I think is a very tangible uh, uh, one. So we started this rethinking process, I think, about uh, almost four years ago. We realized that although we are uh, very active in the area of, of youth, we have an operational strategy, we have um, uh, many work plans across the globe, uh, we uh, realized that through a review and an evaluation of some of the work that we've done, that we still treat young people as beneficiaries for all the talk of empowerment, uh, we still design the projects more and large and then hand them over to young people to implement, which is really a very big shortcoming. We also don't engage enough with young people in the thinking process. I think it's a lot of implementation and it's implementation after the fact. So, um, and all of this is, is on the website, so I'm not going to be uh, tedious and I'm very happy to follow on after Nihal because as she said, we are working together. The UN system is making a very big effort under UN reform to come together. I hope you will always challenge us on that. You should not be pulled and pushed in different directions. We need to do a better job of making sure that we nurture you together, that we work to do what you think needs to be done, and that you push back if you feel that this is a competition on our side, because it shouldn't be. I, mean, I think there's enough, enough issues and enough uh, dynamics, I think, out there for us to be able to deal uh, with many, many uh, thematic areas uh, as well. So we decided to create a, a concept which has met with some resistance from our member states, and I'm going to be very frank, Ambassador still expect to choose youth participants to events. Our national commissions and governments still expect that they will decide who comes to our events. We've been pushing back very gently and I must say successfully finally. We have arrived at a, at a model which is called the youth space. I think we realize that most young people just need the space uh, in order to be able to elaborate their own ideas, to be able to experiment a little bit, a safe space, uh, I think we like to think, uh, where we can bring some of our knowledge, some of our expertise, some of the tools, I'll say more later. So we've turned the equation around. We don't try not to work with uh, representative youth. I think we want to work with young researchers, young scientists, young anthropologists, young journalists. This is the issue, to go really straight to the heart of where young people are populating the professional ladder as well. Young activists in climate change um, who are really turning things around. Um, we are trying to do a few things. First of all, make sure that youth are represented in all of our activities. From That means from our executive board, we are encouraging delegations to have youth participants, and we have succeeded in this. Um, and we are doing an open call for participation in several of our youth spaces so that we don't have to go through uh, a government channel, uh, not because that's not uh, a good idea, but sometimes uh, we are in a small pool of people. Uh, and I think we need to broaden uh, the access a little bit and these days I think we can be a little bit more, um, I think, democratic and participatory in the selection process. We are also trying to make sure that youth priorities as perspectives are integrated. So every time we have a workshop, every time we have a forum. Uh, we are making sure that there is, just as we make sure that about 50% of all panelists are women most of the time, and I'm glad to see this is a healthy phenomenon around this table. We don't have that challenge, happily. Uh, but it's also the voice of youth themselves directly, not representatives again. And we're doing a training of our own staff to understand, just as we did when we tried to uh, engender our conversations. I think this is very important. For our colleagues in UNESCO, we have uh, trained uh, at headquarters and in field offices, how to work with young people, because it's not the same. I think you all expect a different way of outreach. You expect a different methodology of engagement. Uh, our formats of deliberation, particularly in the intergovernmental system, are a little bit stale, a little bit traditional, a little bit old-fashioned, maybe. And I think it's good to think that all of that is something that we can evolve and, uh, and modernize a little bit. 
Um, where, where we need young people, I think we need young people uh, especially to help us push the envelope uh, on where we see the biggest challenges, the biggest risks in the moment. For UNESCO, this means we have to strengthen the implementation of the human rights-based approach. It means our mandate on the right to education, which is very important, particularly the education of women and girls, um, and innovative ways of doing that. In the issue of cultural protection and cultural diversity, we've had many, many important campaigns uh, where young people have really taken the lead in protecting their heritage and understanding that this is universal also. We're doing a big campaign in the city of Mosul in Iraq uh, where uh, we are talking about revitalizing the spirit of Mosul and where young people are going to be a critical part of, of putting together the social fabric that has been. So part of it will be about the physical reconstruction, but a large part is going to be working with the local communities, particularly the young people, the local authorities as well, where we have a big stake. Um, we believe in freedom of expression, obviously, safety of journalists, for example. We have young people populating media and information literacy uh, across uh, the world, and this is very important for us. And, and how we can tap into uh, those nodes of knowledge um, and of course, understanding the right to benefits from science, uh, and this is very important, the social and the human sciences, but also the natural sciences. Uh, we had a great meeting last year on resilience to climate change in the Caribbean. I challenged the young people who were participating with us to do their own. They launched a youth network. We're now going to support them to have a forum this year uh, in Havana. Uh, to look at the youth contribution, to look at the youth engagement in it. And I think that's really um, great. We are open for ideas. Of course, we've had two workout sessions. As uh, Nihal was saying, we've all had activities which we have tried to coordinate here, but I think we are all covering different aspects. We did a session on youth um, and intercultural uh, competencies. We have a session going on right now on youth and peace. And at lunchtime, at 1 o'clock, we're going to bring all those young people together to talk about youth spaces and understand a little bit better how they want us to move forward on this issue. The specific project that we have uh, with the United Nations Office of Counterterrorism uh, is actually about preventing violent extremism through youth empowerment in Jordan, Libya, Morocco, and Tunisia, uh, co-funded with Canada. Um, this is, again, understanding the role of young people as agents of change. Um, uh, looking at a very inclusive, participatory approach, but looking also at multi sectorality. I think also the silos of how we work uh, need to uh, really come together a little bit more. I think we need to understand you, you shouldn't have to figure out who works in what sector, in what section, in which uh, structure. I mean, I think we need to come together in a better way so that you can uh, really leverage what we have. But the objective uh, is that we um, can make sure that the values base that we work from is, is a joint one, is a common one, that we have a good base of knowledge and skills shared. Um, that we can uh, talk about exchange and cooperation beyond cultural and linguistic boundaries. This is very important. I think you are probably more uh, multicultural uh, than any other generation has been, I think, in the outreach. But some of it is a little bit uh, limited also. There are still many stereotypes. There are still many limitations, I think, to cultural understanding. And we'd like to help push the boundaries of that to make sure that these are not superficial experiences, but that you really can do what you want to do. I think. Uh, supporting meaningful civic engagement, encouraging peace-building experiences, and of course, as I said, promoting human rights. So uh, there have been many concrete actions. I don't know whether this has already been discussed, but I, um, I think it's, it's, a, it's a good set of issues, media and information literacy. One of our uh, colleagues is here, Hanin Thabit from Jordan, uh, is here. Uh, she participated in a series of training of trainers and is now a mentor in her own uh, community. Safeguarding cultural heritage, as I said, we have an Arab World Heritage Youth Forum coming up. Um, and um, engaging formal, non-formal, informal education sectors. A lot of education doesn't happen in the classroom anymore. The classroom is still very important, but it happens at the community base, it happens in the community club. Um, and, and we'd like to think about how we can do more. Uh, using sport has been very important to us. Um, when, when, when I visited, uh, for example, refugee camps or displaced camps, it's amazing how young women in particular uh, in the middle, uh, in, in South Sudan, which is very, very difficult, I think, if 
if you go to a youth center in uh, a refugee camp and you ask the young women what they want, uh, the first thing they said to me was uh, their own football club. Uh, and I, I think this notion of how youth can can really find sport as a liberating uh, factor is very important. So uh, not to be exhaustive, but just to say these are some ideas. We really value um, the engagement, and I hope that you will keep us on our toes to be uh, more uh, inquisitive, to be more curious, to be more responsive and more agile in getting back to you on your needs. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Madam, for your remarks and for UNESCO's strong partnership with UNOCT. As we all know, uh, success is a journey and not a destination. Uh, we started this journey together, but how to make that journey innovative and all-inclusive is uh, what we are here to discuss and hopefully seek uh, inputs for. Um, we also are very much uh, committed to, of course, uh, delivering the value together and creating that uh, value is very important. Thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I propose that we now move to the next part of our program, which is an opportunity for me to tell you a little bit more about our work at the United Nations Office of Counterterrorism on youth and invite your ideas and feedback to guide our work moving forward. Um, as a preface to this, I would like to play a brief video, which we prepared for the first United Nations high level conference of heads of counterterrorism agencies, which was convened by Secretary General Guterres last year in June. And that was the first uh, event held in New York of that scale. And we had very strong participation from all countries, including um, Azerbaijan and uh, 150 countries came. Um, we played this video and uh, um, what we saw yesterday uh, during the morning presentation and opening remarks by President Alif. I think the, the video we saw yesterday was very moving, very emotional, and uh, it is uh, the way how people felt uh, in the conference room where it, it got to the heart of everybody who was uh, listening to uh, President Aliyev. Um, the high-level conference addressed a broad range of counterterrorism priorities which are now uh, f we are now following upon, including the need to engage youth for global action against violent extremism conducive to terrorism. Let me play a video for you. Thank you.
Thank you. After this video, I would like to give you a short overview of our work on youth, what we have done, our current efforts and our vision moving forward. UNOCT has worked with UN partners over the years to engage youth in the prevention of violent extremism because preventing new people from joining terrorist groups is a strategic imperative. Addressing youth unemployment is a priority in the UN plan of action to prevent violent extremism. This is not because unemployment necessarily leads to terrorism, but because having a decent livelihood certainly builds resilience against. The UN Counterterrorism Center, together with ILO, has successfully implemented projects on youth engagement, skills development, and employment facilitation in Pakistan and Bangladesh. We have trained more than 400 principals of technical and vocational education training institutes on effective skills development, job placement, civil engagement, tolerance, and inclusion so that their institutes can continuously produce young adults who can secure a livelihood to support their families. We are working to expand these initiatives to other countries, including Iraq, Indonesia, and the Maldives, in response to the growing interest of member states in employment facilitation and skills development for prevention of violent extremism. Our United Nations Counterterrorism Center is also cooperating with UNESCO on a project for prevention of violent extremism through youth empowerment in Jordan, Tunisia, Libya, and Morocco. The project has three aims, to make youth key actors primarily through cultural heritage activities, to mainstream prevention of violent extremism in the education center, to communicate prevention of violent extremism strategically through media, including social media, and through building the capacity of young journalists, conflict-sensitive reporting, as well as developing campaigns to counter violent extremism narratives and hate speech. Together with UNESCO, we have engaged, built the capacity, and trained over 500 young people, including over 50 in Tunisia, over 200 in Jordan, over 40 in Libya, and over 200 in Morocco. We are now working to consolidate and step, out, step up our work, following up on the outcomes of the first United Nations high-level conference of heads of counterterrorism agencies, which I mentioned earlier today. We believe that youth engagement needs to be sustained through a solid long-term framework to offer member states on a strategic basis capacity building support with and for youth in line with the Global Counterterrorism Strategy and Security Council Resolutions 2250 and 2149 dedicated to youth peace and security matters. Employment facilitation and vocational training is important, but as UNOCT, we can and need to do more. We should do so on all levels, drawing on the range of different expertise in the UN system and beyond, in a collaborative spirit to deliver as one UN. Therefore, our office recently became a member of the UN Interagency Network on Youth Development, and we participate regularly in the Global Coalition on Youth, Peace and Security. We work through the United Nations Global Counterterrorism Coordination Compact and its eight working groups to make sure that prevention and countering violent extremism efforts focused on youth are carried out with a mindset of partnership with youth. We also emphasize youth engagement and participation in our support to member states, which are developing or implementing national and regional plans of action as part of a holistic and inclusive whole of society approach. To take this ambition and commitment to the next level, we have initiated the first phase for the development of a comprehensive global youth program. This new program is intended to reinforce and advance our current youth engagement activities and to promote interagency collaboration on youth-focused 
prevention and countering violent extremism efforts. As part of this process, we will conduct 10 national and four regional youth consultation workshops, as well as online surveys to make sure the program is based on evidence, data, and the views of young people. We have already launched a short online survey earlier last week before we arrived here at Baku on the occasion of this side event, and, and I invite you all here to take it and share it with your contacts. We will invite some respondents to travel to New York for our first round face-to-face -face consultation. The survey is available under the following link, which you can see on your screen. If you also follow us on Twitter, we are under UN underscore OCT. You can always find the latest information about what we are doing on a daily basis, what is happening in UN headquarters on counterterrorism efforts, and you can find our survey there. We will also produce a documentary to highlight the positive contribution of youth to PCVE efforts, which will be screened at the launch event for the program. Finally, in response to the call from the Security Council in its resolution on youth 2250 to increase inclusive representation of youth in decision-making at all levels, to prevent and counter violent extremism, we are planning to create a UNOCT youth advisory group to make sure that views of youth are continuously reflected in the UN policies and programming. And through the advisory group, we all here sitting in front of you will be getting the inputs and tailoring the program based on the feedback. Our vision moving forward is enabled and empowered youth that actively prevent and counter violent extremism on all levels and in partnership with the UN and all other actors. We aim to achieve that by developing our youth program in partnership with young people themselves, delivering a data-driven, evidence-based and youth-informed approach to prevention and countering violent extremism. This is an urgent priority, not because young people are the future, but because they already are at present full of energy, motivation, and ideas. It is our job to make sure they have seat at the table and say in what affects them. The youth program will also draw on the strong and unique coordination mandate of our office and will provide an interface for UN interagency collaboration on youth-focused PCVE efforts to scale up good practices and existing initiatives and to truly deliver as one UN with youth to prevent violent extremism. The youth program will provide a modality for us to collaborate with civil society organizations and private sector actors. We are already engaged with United Network of Young Peace Builders and the UN Major Group for Children and Youth in this process, and we want to better engage with actors in the, in the gaming and social media industry. We will broaden the scope of our work beyond youth entrepreneurship, skills development, and quality education. We would like to engage young religious leaders to promote tolerance and value pluralism, reducing the impact of hate speech, violent extremism narratives, and incitement to terrorism. We would like to better leverage sports and other extracurricular activities to prevent violent extremism. We would like to harness technological innovation and gaming to help create safe online communities. We would welcome your ideas here, how we can partner and your thoughts on how our offices could engage with youth to prevent violent extremism. The impact we want to have is strengthen youth resilience against violent extremism, leading to reduced recruitment of youth to violent extremists at terrorist organizations. This is where our focus is today, and we would like to remain very focused and on the positive contribution that youth are making and can make further in the fight against terrorism. It is our joint responsibility to make sure that nobody is left behind, and this means to create avenues for youth to participate. Young people care, and we should care more about them. Terrorism affects us all, and all of us, including youth, must unite to counter terrorism. Thank you for your attention.
We will now be moving to the next segment of this side event, which is a panel discussion with uh, the experts and practitioners who will be sharing with us their insight, their work, their experience on how to engage, empower, and partner with you through innovative approaches to build resi resilience to violent extremism. I'm particularly interested in hearing their views on the following points. What are the challenges and gaps in youth engagement and vocational trainings? What are some innovative cutting-edge approaches in these fields undertaken by their companies and organizations? What are good practices to effectively consult youth? What is vocational training for the future? How do we measure impact? And how can technology help us better understand and measure resilience to violence? I'm sure that they will be providing us with a lot of food for thought, after which we will have a few minutes for me to open the floor for possible questions and recommendations from our audience. Without further ado, I will give the floor to Mr. Kenesh Beksai Nazarov, who works for Search for Common Ground as Regional Director for Central Asia. You have the floor, sir. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Alirzaeva. Uh, thank you, uh, dear organizers, uh, UNOCT, uh, UNESCO, UNAOC, and, and the host country, and uh, which I had an amazing uh, time throughout my life uh, visiting Azerbaijan uh, 1988, 1994, uh, 2006, 2012, and now. And every time I come, and uh, although uh, those 15 former Soviet countries have uh, departed uh, in 1991 as one, uh, with one startup but I can see that how the country is uh, developing and moving forward. And uh, today, the, the country is hosting this high-level uh, discussion the last uh, two days. Thank you. Um, so uh, I would like to deliver my uh, speech on behalf of the uh, two uh, movements we have created out of Central Asia in um, combination with uh, Youth for Peace uh, movement, which sparked um, as a result of the UN uh, Security Council Re Resolution 2250. Um, and they are called, one of them called is Jash Stan, which is a young country, Stan. Another one is called, uh, out of Kazakhstan, is called uh, um, Jastar for Peace, which is uh, Youth for Peace. And particularly, I would like to make the following statements on behalf of AIDA, who used to be uh, one of the, who used to belong to one of the extremist organizations and um, spreading the sentiments in the Hujra uh, method, Hujravi uh, approach uh, through the uh, religious settings uh, among the girls. Another one is uh, Kairat who comes also from a vulnerable um, family. And being a um, bro uh, broker at the uh, cattle uh, market on, on weekends, but he has been absolutely per portrayed, first of all, to us when we came to, to his com first com community as a perpetuator of all sorts of different uh, viol violence. Um, I think. Today, in combination, in relation to youth engagement, uh, vocational training, um, and addressing discrimination, inequality, and violence, um, we have fundamental three problems in our approaches and understanding. They are, the first one is that technology has revolutionized everything today in uh, the whole of our life. However, the education has not, especially when it comes to vocational education. And let me tell you one story. Um, about two years ago, we wanted to uh, bring a vocational training uh, skills, integrate into one of the madrasas in, in the Fergana Valley. And it has taken us almost a year to convince the governments of that particular country that this is a needed 
skill for the madrasa students who are to tomorrow's generation for this country. Because um, with all sorts of framework and regulations and laws, um, the, um, the education is actually captivated with a lot of not to do's rather than to do's. The second, when, we come, when it comes to um, uh, violent extremism and radicalization, the immediate and natural um, response is countering, and which we believe is deceptive and is not going to yield any tangible results because we will be countering something that is ideological and, and through our efforts. And rather than we believe it would be better if we could cultivate to what we have um, in our life, what connects us, more positive sides of it. And the third one is comes to the skills that how and to what extent we support the kids who are the generation of the next generation with the right skills who could operate in outside world tomorrow. The Search for Common Ground is one of the co-facilitators of this uh, UN Security Council Resolution 2250, um, has been out front in seeking an um, innovative approach how we can best utilize the limited resor resources we have and based on the lessons learned to bring in the program that makes difference. The first, we thought we, we really sought where the rupture is when it comes to 2250. And based on our analysis, we put the, our finger around unheard youth. And these are not youth who you see today in this, in this uh, circle. These are unheard youth who have a lot of a strong um, grievance because they are discriminated systematically and they have a failing education and they don't have a, they have a, a weak social fabric in the family, outside, among peers, and in their community. And some people call them as lost, but they have, they have every reason to be disengaged with the um, regular uh, vertical and horizontal institutions we have today. Based on that, um, we found out that the percentage of unheard youth who are vulnerable or who are at most risk, by and large among the young people who uh, distinguished panels today have said, is a very tiny percentage maybe 2%, maybe 3% among all the youth cohort in every country. And to put something, the programming that affects them is going to make a big difference, we believe. The second, um, Mr. Uh, Alerzaeva has used a very good, I think, the term called uh, employment facilitation rather than capacity building. And how we can um, go away from uh, seeing the youth as an uh, object and turning them into the, uh, uh, to the subject, to the uh, object. And in relation to that, I think um, we have engaged uh, a, a programming called we, we, we call um, the inspiration through education. And that um, set of workshops, trainings, and interaction creates a dignity to, uh, on a personal level, gives a sense of purpose for this unheard young people, and creates a meaning or the cause 
that this young person can take in throughout in his life. Something like we all, that connects all of us, right? Although we work in, in different organizations, but we stand behind a specific cause on preventing violent extremism and radicalization. And in combination of that, that has given a window of light to young people that they worth of something, they can do something. It's kind of an igniting the, um, igniting a skill or aspiration they, they, they've had or the dream. The second, we have partnered with, we call mentors. These are the youth champions who also come from the same kind of background. Um, one of them could be me because I come from a, from a very remote uh, countryside in uh, Badakhshan of uh, Tajikistan. And I, I, I first time uh, seen a foreigner when I was 16. And, but we have given them purpose and connection between the mentor and mentee for inspiration and, and engagement. And that has given, ignited the um, dream and, and aspiration even further. The third programmatic area which we ignited was, we call it, engaging with the elders. And that had happened only after we we have worked, we did a considerable amount of work with the elder counterparts themselves, with, be it in the local authority who sees the young people as, 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 uh, as the object that has nothing, can, uh, who, who cannot contribute anything tangible, or, or the religious uh, uh, leaders, or the, even coming to the parents who have disengaged with their parents with their, with their kids, um, um, putting a uh, risk to the social um, fabric inside the family. And that has created a, an enormous opportunity for these unheard young people to come out with their own concept, how they see, how they could uh, contribute to community development. And we have helped them refine their uh, um, uh, project concepts and put them into the action, but yet we have created another challenge. We said, we have a limited funding, but would you be willing to go out to the community, in your own community, tap into the resources, um, the business, non-governmental organizations or the government organizations have, and amazingly, Last year, when we reported uh, the results of the first phase of our um, program, which is uh, supported by the UN Peacebuilding Fund, and amazingly, the 60% of the um, uh, funds that were generated um, uh, behind those causes were coming from the communities, from small businesses, from local governments, and, and, and uh, individual philanthropists. So, and so that, that has, in combination, those three different aspects of engagement with unheard young people, has sparked an um, approach, we call it um, exploring him or herself in, in community building. And today, um, we can see that around 20% of the 324 uh, young people who we work with are ended up playing an, uh, youth affairs work in, in their own local government. And that has created a long journey to this, uh, to this young, young people. And coming back to the story of Aida and Khairat, Today, Khairat is the member of the local government in his own community and playing a, a catalytic role between the, young, uh, uh, the unheard young people who come from different uh, religious uh, organizations 
and the, and the rest of the young people. And Aida has opened her own um, hairdresser saloon, and, and they contribute 20% uh, of their uh, profit on monthly basis to, to uh, elderly and, um, and, and, and the uh, uh, orphanages. And this is kind of a uh, journey which, which I, I have seen um, uh, that happened with those young people in the last spectrum of uh, 30, 36 months. And uh, uh, these were the main points which I wanted to deliver uh, to you today. Thank you. Thank you, Kenneshbeck, for your presentation. I think you gave us um, a good idea and very inspiring thoughts about the work of your organization. I understand you joined Search for Common Ground in 2013. That's a huge progress over the period of less than six years. And you manage programs on conflict-sensitive journalism, religious freedom, youth and women empowerment, and preventing violent extremism. Uh, the thoughts I take away from, the, from this presentation, if I may, I just would like to summarize that um, the organization you work with is focusing on three fundamental problems we heard here. is uh, technology revolution, uh, and that, rev uh, that affected our lives. Uh, we, have, uh, the, we have to face uh, violent extremism and radicalization, and the countering might not be the most productive way to address it. It can be deceptive and will not necessarily yield the desirable results. And we would like also to think to what extent we can support kids. What I also learned from your presentation, that we need to focus on unheard youth, the people who have strong grievances and they are presently disengaged. You also are trying to um, address the generation's gap, uh, engaging with the elders in order to overcome the gap. And thank you so much for all these uh, thoughts. Um, I would like us to hear a different angle, how the, uh, the uh, PVE issues are addressed. And I would like now to give the floor to Mr. Tony Skro. Uh, Tony is Chief Executive Officer of Ad Venture Partners, which manages the initiative called Peer to Peer, Challenging Extremism, and Facebook Global Digital Challenge. His company builds social impact partnerships connecting students, educators, nonprofits, and industry leaders on over 900 university campuses and in 75 countries. These are very impressive numbers, Tony, so we can't wait to hear from you. Thank you, Seville. Hi, everyone. My name is Tony, Tony Scro, and I am the CEO of Adventure Partners in San Francisco, California, and I appreciate being able to introduce you to our peer-to-peer Facebook Global Digital Challenge. What I'm going to briefly do is introduce you to our academic partnership model of peer-to-peer, -peer, which I think you'll find very interesting, and then also showcase four different programs from around the world. Um, Peer-to-peer -peer started four years ago as a public-private sector partnership between the U.S. National Counterterrorism Center, the U.S. Department of State, and Facebook on 23 universities. Today, we've implemented over 700 peer-to-peer -peer programs on 380 different universities, including four in Azerbaijan, and we're in 75 different countries. And peer-to-peer -peer is the largest single surge against extremism and hate speech, prejudice, and discrimination that youth and civil society has implemented. We've had 15,000 students go through the actual curriculum program, and on Facebook alone, it has reached 250 million people. The reason and the identification of why peer-to-peer -peer works is based upon this particular theory. Who better to create the counter-messaging, to challenge an extremism, hate speech in all forms than the very same audience extremists are trying to recruit. It makes perfect sense. Empower tech-savvy young students who know their communities and let them create the messaging. Now, this is important. Peer-to-peer -peer 
in, in peer to peer, students not only create the message, but they are the messengers with the belief that local problems need local solutions. So this is how they do it. So let's say you are a student in peer to peer. You are in an international relations, peace, conflict, terrorism studies class, or marketing, advertising, communication, social media. You are earning academic credit. Anywhere from 50 to 100% of your grade is the peer to peer program. We break you up into a real social media agency such as advertising, app development, budget, graphic design, strategy, social media, public relations. You identify a target audience, you do research, you submit a creative brief about four weeks into the semester. We love it. We give you $1,000, $750 in Facebook ad credit, and then say, now go implement your peer-to-peer -peer campaign. Let's not just talk about pushing back on extremism and hate speech. Let's build the dialogue into action. This program is all about doing. We also have a competition, regional, national, and international, and I'm happy to say Kazar University from Baku was in Washington, D.C. a few years ago and placed third in a very, very competitive program, so great job. Now, this is a really exciting uh, percentage. 25% of all the programs are still going, so there's great continuity. We have seen students adapt their peer-to-peer -peer campaign as either an NGO, a nonprofit, or even as a for-profit business. So what I'm going to do now is quickly go through four different programs. Now that you know what the objective of the program is, you are designed to create an initiative product or a tool to push back on extremism. So this is how four different universities did it. When 200,000 migrants were passing through Slovenia, the students at University of Ljubljana were amazed, unfortunately, how effective the media was in creating fear and paranoia with the Slovenian population. The student's research indicated that acts of violence can be born from fear-mongering and misguided public opinion. So with, as, as technology students, they decided to develop a technology platform that would go after, fight fire with fire, and reduce the amount of fear that the Slovenian media was creating. So what the students did is they created the Fear Index, which is an innovative, cloud-based, algorithmic database that identifies fear-inducing words in the Slovenian media. So essentially what you would do is find an article that you think has a bias, you would populate that middle section of this overhead here, and a number would pop up either one to 10. What that number represents is how many fear-inducing words are included in that piece. So what the fear index does is it takes the proportion of fear-inducing words and measures that against how many words are in the article. It's absolutely brilliant. And the students did that over 15 weeks. Within the first two weeks of the program being up, 140,000 people utilized this. Um, Boko Haram, aggressively recruits eight to 15 year old girls to become suicide bombers. So at the American University of Nigeria, the students use that as the platform to develop a campaign to unite women in Nigeria to mobilize and be empowered to develop campaigns to push back on extremism in their local communities. WhatsApp is the singular most important and most popular app in Nigeria, so what the students did, what they wanted to do is get 100 women who would then get another 100 women to develop campaigns and a network to go after violent extremism in the northeast corner of Nigeria. This compounding effect was incredibly successful and the team got 10,000 women in Northeast Nigeria to go into the villages, shops, and community and educating young Quranic girls, 18 to 15 year olds, how to say no and resist when Boko Haram would come and to try to strap on a suicide vest. They also, working with adults, as you can see in the bottom left-hand corner, gave workshops 
to schools on how to effectively barricade doors to slow down the attack when Boko Haram was trying to attack the school. The students also met with government officials, USAID. They had media interviews all throughout Nigeria. And for the sake of time, I'm not going to show it, but this is one of four absolutely remarkable videos that they created called A Girl Like Me. Who are Boko Haram's female suicide bombers? A girl like me. And it's absolutely remarkable. University of Belgrade, very interesting. What they did is they created a play called It's Your Choice based upon real life stories of young Serb men who went to Syria and got killed in jihad. Now what's interesting about this particular program is they use storytelling as a way to affect behavior, which is very powerful with millennials and Gen Z. But I also wanted to share this with you because this is a good example of a low tech peer to peer program. And when I'm speaking to administrators in South Sudan or Sierra Leone that have frequent electricity outages, and spotty internet, they can still do effective programming against extremism and violence by a simple program such as plays and storytelling. So this is a very effective program. Curtin University, my last example, this is a mobile app that students created to um, generate a sense of community and partnership for vulnerable young Muslims. Every day there were daily affirmations that would be offered to the user so you could live your life to the fullest that day. They also had a competitive element where you could actually compete with friends and you could score points to see who was providing the most helpful um, assistance to people in need. This was a hit with the Somali community in Perth, Australia. So with that said, that is a quick snapshot of just four different campaigns out of the 700 that students have implemented over the last four years. Thank you. Tony, thank you so much. I think what I learned personally that there is no limit to creati creativity and innovation when we harness it in the right way. Um, I would like now to give the floor to our panelist, Mr. Zain Haiderawan, who I had the honor to meet yesterday and get to know him a little bit better. Zain is the Growth and Operations Manager of ReCoded, a non-profit organization that provides training to conflict-affected youth to become technology leaders, preparing them for the future work. Zain is an advocate and specialist in youth development. He was notably the youngest serving director of the British Youth Council and has worked on education, entrepreneurship and innovation. Thank you, Zion, for being here and you have the floor. Thank you. Um, sorry. This... Yeah, first. Yep. Just waiting. Okay. Uh, thank you ever so much for that introduction. Uh, in the interest of time, I would uh, excuse the formalities, but thank you once again to the organizers for inviting us and uh, allowing us to share the mission of Recoded. And if through this sharing, um, explore collaborations, but more importantly, how we can sort of look at the whole PVE agenda in a more creative way. There's some really interesting points which were being mentioned, and I'd really like to reflect on those points too, about the whole idea of facilitation of employment, how do you get young people into employment? As we know, there's a famous British saying which says the devil makes work of idle hands. Um, so when you have inactivity within an economy, this can also lead to vulnerability and um, young people turning towards uh, extremist ideologies or being more vulnerable towards that thought. But the question then arises, what happens when you don't have economic opportunities creating employment for young people to be funneled into. And this is where Recoded comes about. So we are uh, a tech for good agency. Um, we are an NGO. Our base is looking at tech, entrepreneurship, and creativity to generate the next generation of leaders. So this is what our problem statement is. We believe that while talent is universal, opportunity is not. And it goes without saying, when we operate across Iraq, um, across war-torn and conflict-affected regions, we notice that talent 
and resilience aren't something which we're building, we're facilitating. And I think a lot of the times when as facilitators we go into a place and a space and we feel like we're the ones that are nurturing this, but actually the talent already exists. What we're doing is equipping those young people to actually take on leadership positions and to generate and to create uh, a new infrastructure for themselves. And this is something which I think is quite alarming because when we look at the rate of how development is evolving compared to the rate of how technology is evolving, these two things don't go actually hand in hand. Technologically, we are experiencing the technological revolution. We are now going to be looking at, the, the figures are between two to four billion young people who will not be prepared for work in the next 10 years. And that's extremely alarming because if we're continuing with our overall development programs of facilitating employment through low means and low skilled labor, then what we're doing is setting up young people to fail. And by doing so, we perpetuate another cycle of, of actual extremist vulnerability because now young people are going to be going through those programs which are not innovative, which are not equipping them with the digital skills they need to keep up with the digital revolution. And it's expanding because we're seeing that across, uh, across the board, from where things used to be outsourced to, uh, to India and developing nations like Pakistan, where tech was being um, outsourced, now you're seeing tech creation and tech giants being born and household names hopefully being born out of those regions. So this is one of the reasons why we seek to exist. We look at serving conflict-affected youth. We re recognize that there is a technical talent gap and definitely a skills mismatch where you're seeing either not enough digital literacy across society to deal with the tech revolution and most notably not enough jobs for young people. So we look at also empowering them through entrepreneurship. So what does Recoded do? We skill youth for the future of work, and by doing so, we skill them for the future of our societies. The digital revolution is, again, as I've mentioned, it's accelerating. Even as we speak right now, there is another milestone being hit in the digital world. And we're sitting here discussing policy, but whilst we discuss policy and we discuss how to engage with young people, the digital world is going on and on. And we need to really understand that. And so within our framework, we ensure that young people are equipped with not only technical know-how, but also the know-how on critical thinking, on soft skills, on how to develop them as young leaders. So this is the model which we've developed over, and I must emphasize, we've only been around for about two years. But um, Recoded has these three models. The first model is education, where we look at the coding boot camps, entrepreneurship, workshops, and we also have a coding for children and coding for kids boot camp, which we run. And all throughout these programs, it's not like a, a university program where you come in and you're just gonna sit there. We actually engage young people in critical thinking on how to look at sort of diverse as a key skill for them also when they're forming their teams to respond. And our programs are also quite immersive. So they have the opportunity to be connected with international mentors. So young people based in Erbil or in Iraq are being connected with international mentors based in Silicon Valley, in London. We also are now looking at diaspora development because diasporas are a huge part of, of narratives, especially within the regions which we operate. The second part we noticed is that once you have young people leaving your program, where do they go? And what tend to happen with us is that they would gravitate around our office and space. So we realized that we needed a space for young people and recognized that there was not enough tech incubation spaces and that's where Recoded House came about. It's a co-working space for the community, but also we, in, through this space we also facilitate cultural and artistic dialogue, which is necessary, especially in parts of Erbil. And currently, Recoded House is our pioneering working space in um, Erbil, uh, Iraqi Kurdistan. And then the third part is our digital agency, where we take young people through our funnel, and some of them will come and work for us in the digital agency, where we find them clients who are mission-aligned, who are trying to make a better change to the world, and provide them with fellow employment. So we hope that we just don't leave young people. So this is one of the things of our missions. And when we look at the four key parts to this, I don't want to iterate what's already on the board for you guys. But this is, I think I really wanted to emphasize one point in this whole section, and that was to look at young women and their participation. 
You can already see that we work with IDPs and young refugees, but one story on a young woman who joined our program. She came to the interview. We normally interview all of our young people that come into our program. She came to the interview with her father. She was extremely shy and timid in the interview, but she was given a place on our coding boot camp. Eight weeks in, this girl is flourishing. She's confident. She's developing her skills, but has also formed a small team. And six months down the line, she comes back to tell us she set up her own business and now is, is now looking at setting up her second business. Now, this is absolutely phenomenal for someone who was very shy and timid and needed her father to accompany her to going to, at the end of the program, being an independent woman who is now uh, delivering her own business and solving problems in her local economy. So our impact in numbers, and this is why for, for the past 18 months, what we've sort of aggregated. Um, in Iraq, we operate across three cities. Um, we have seven programs and 150 people have been trained, 150 children introduced to coding, um, and a cutting edge facility, which is Recoded House. We had a passion project in Yemen, where we had a web development program um, in Sana'a with eight students, which was done out of just a grassroots fundraising campaign. And in Turkey, we operate in two cities in Gaziantep and Istanbul um, and three programs which run uh, simultaneously uh, and have subsequently had 58 people trained. Iraq, where our main focus is right now, uh, we operate in Erbil and Karakosh in Baghdad. Um, and now uh, we are expanding our operations to Basra where we're lo lo uh, partnering up with local partners. And through this we've actually managed to gain over 200 plus youth and children, uh, some of which have gone on to direct employment, some are running their own businesses, uh, others have come up with their own solution to Amazon in Iraq, um, and have had notable acclaim from like international media outlets too. And so this is how the Tech Startup Academy is. We have the eight, star so eight startups which have been born out of here. Um, over this co course of four weeks, young people are getting together and they look at how to basically find a new way to look at startups as well. Because tech and coding is one part. Entrepreneurship is another part. How do you take the skill of tech and coding? How do you realize what problems exist within your society, be they local or national? How do you respond to them through um, an innovative way? But this is what I really want to focus on, which is tech beyond the code. And how do we sort of, as recoded, empower young people to think about the society they live in? The first part is soft skills, as I've mentioned. The second part is community, forming, allowing young people to form themselves together and to create cultures where they actually appreciate uh, diversity and they don't see collaboration as a deficit and realize that competition is healthy for them, but collaboration is stronger. The third part is alumni not leaving beneficiaries by themselves, and the fourth is diversity, as is mentioned. Um, and this is where we're looking for 2019. Uh, across, across Iraq now, looking at Erbil, Baghdad, and Basra, and it's become a really powerful a movement now where people are becoming more and more engaged. We're not having to promote as much as young people are signing up and are being put on waiting lists. So this is Recoded House, just a few images. The three parts to us as Recoded House, co-working space, a maker space, and arts and cultural programming. Now it's extremely important, especially as people that work within innovative practice, not to forget and not to ignore the already existing community that resides and sometimes needs a space to, to come together. What we've realized since launching this in April, early April, is that that space has become uh, a place where young people, activists, and also humanitarians are coming in, local young people that needed a space, and are programming for us, as opposed to us intervening. Creative Circles was born out of a conversation with a Kurdish filmmaker called Barry Shalamashi, who was fed up of uh, representation of the Kurdistan region being very orientalist, and she wanted her voice to be found. Women That Can, can came about from a female activist and feminist, Dashni Murad, who is local to uh, Kurdistan, and her, she herself was a singer, but now has turned into a humanitarian. And these are events which we run, and scholarships and places which we'll be running in the space too. And finally, I get to this final point as to what can happen when you cross-collaborate. This is a prime example of, um, is everyone familiar with a hackathon? So we gave young people across Iraq two issues to solve. 
So in five different cities, they were asked to sign up to two different issues. And in the space of 48 hours, young people were coming together, creating, solving issues which were most local to them, but also most prominent to the country at large. It was the largest uh, hackathon in Iraq. It was the largest tech event in Iraq. And it was led by young people, for young people, solving issues of their society from renewables and plastics all the way to local issues. Why do I mention this in a CV sort of format? Because when you talk about young people, and I end on this remark, when we talk about young people and we talk about them engaging within CV frameworks, what is the best way of engagement? For us, it's the response to civic engagement. How do you turn young people into civil, uh, sort of civil society leaders, but how do they become people that when they're leading their businesses, they're conscious to the society they live in? The issue many times is that when we approach CVE, we want to talk about violent extremism to young people when they're trying to look at getting the next job. If you can create a hybrid program whereby tech or innovation or innovative practice is combined with a consciousness towards society and giving back, then you can combine the elements of community, collaboration and a, a social consciousness to create a more established and more progressive society which is safe and secure for everyone. Thank you. Zain, thank you so much for your uh, inspirational presentation and I would like to thank you uh, for being a young leader influencer and the person who is trying to make a change in this world. This is really appreciated. Uh, we, have we have now heard from our three uh, panelists. Uh, I certainly learned a lot. Uh, and uh, we have uh, very limited time for two, three questions, and we would be happy to take it from you if you have any questions. Please, uh, raise your hand, just introduce yourself, and tell us what you would like to know. Please go ahead. Thank you for this opportunity. Uh, we know I am Fargana Bayramle. We know that uh, globalization, peace, and justice are significant factors in our contemporary world. So that's why we are thankful to United Nations for intensification of some declarations and resolutions to protect peace and justice. My question is uh, for Ms. Uh, Nihal Saad. Uh, we know that there are some key challenges in project implementation. And what are the main uh, tools and techniques to manage all these challenges and some uh, solutions for these uh, problems. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your question. Um, well, I mean, yes, uh, indeed, there are challenges, and uh, I think that the challenge uh, in um, implementing projects in general at the United Nations is the uh, limited resources and the uh, funding resources. Um, so um, this is the biggest challenge, I think, but uh, the, pro um, the, the successful projects are out there, uh, successful youth are out there, and uh, they have the ambition, they have the knowledge, they have the skills, but uh, unfortunately there is a limitation to what we can do and how many of these projects that we can support, and I wish that we can do more. And that's why when I'm in the beginning, uh, at the very beginning when I mentioned the um, uh, UNOCT, and I said that they now are sort of an umbrella where underneath we, uh, other UN entities are working together, we do not have to work in silos because when we put our resources together, whether this is financial resources or all uh, uh, human resources, we can do uh, better and we can do um, a lot more. Hello, I'm Sabalieva. Uh, well, I would like to ask a question involving um, one picture that I've seen during the first part, I've seen a picture of Marlene Le Pen. Well, the problem is, actually the point is, while talking about extremism, fighting, uh, discrimination, and so on, we're most, we mostly focus on uh, developing and third world countries. But the thing is, uh, as we see now, America with Donald Trump, uh, and among the main donors here, uh, is Spain, and Spain with Vox par uh, Party, and also Marie Le Pen. 
that we see that the we shouldn't only focus on third world countries. So why don't we do, um, I mean, why don't we invest in such uh, campaigns uh, covering European countries, for example? Because uh, discrimination is not only about Muslims, is not only about developing countries. And for example, uh, Vox is like they're celebrating their record, and uh, they're first for the first time selected with 24 uh, seats in the Spanish Parliament for the first time in their history. So we see that uh, the ten tendency for extremism not in Iraq, Sudan, and so on only, but also in Europe. Um, thank you for your question. Very interesting. As uh, uh, our Secretary General said, um, terrorism is not associated with any religion, culture, or any particular country. And certainly in our programs and what you've seen today, they do have impact on the whole world. And that's certainly the intention of it and the objectives. We are not focusing on any particular part of the world, and the youth program we are launching is meant to cover the whole globe in a very broad way. So I'm asking you to take this survey and include the comment you just made as part of your inputs, and we certainly will take this into account in the design of our youth program. This is your opportunity to speak and, and contribute directly to the UN work. Thank you for your question. One more question. Please, sir. Can you hear me? Okay, yeah. now I think there are too many mics on. Um, thank you for one, the, all the wonderful presentation from all of you out here. Um, from Nigeria and uh, coming with the experience of uh, my colleague over there that said, talked about this great messaging for women. I'm really impressed and, and would like to use that tool further to expand the work in other regions of Nigeria and probably in Africa. Uh, having said that, did you, any of you consider uh, engaging communities uh, that had experienced this violence and the fact that some have been re uh, re de radicalized, particularly the youths, how the host communities will accept them when they come back. If that is experience that has occurred and is successful, we are happy to, to, to learn and, and to, um, to also share how, uh, for instance, fighters go back and they are not stigmatized and they are accepted. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for your question. Uh, the United Nations is uh, working on the program, which is also known as Foreign Terrorist Fighters, to address also the program uh, uh, with their families and their children and their wives. It's on the agenda, and our office has been developing on, uh, has been working on developing the key principles. The document has been finalized, and we are sharing it with member states to provide some guidance how to treat. In terms of community outreach, uh, the people like yourself, uh, uh, we hope, can help us to achieve uh, that community engagement. Because what we heard during the high-level conference last year, what I mentioned, uh, which was attended not only by governments, but uh, by uh, organizations, national, regional, international, the civil society organizations, that we are not doing enough to reach out to community. We know it's a challenge. We continue to work on that. And our office actually has uh, created the partnership section within our office exactly for that purpose, to work with the communities. So the work continues, and we will be uh, looking for your inputs as well. Thank you for your questions. Um, thank you so much for your participation, for your time, for being here, for listening. Um, and uh, if there are no further interventions, unfortunately, we run out of time. I would like to sincerely thank everybody here. 
uh, for all your contributions. And I hope to see you soon. Uh, this is not the last event we are attending, and we will have time to communicate. Uh, I will be here in the conference room until the rest of the day, as well as the team in front of you. If you would like to come and discuss it further, we would be happy to do so. Thank you, and, and have a good day.